Good evening. Uh, let me point out, first of all, that there are a number of seats in the front, so please feel free um, to move on forward. Um, I'm Mark Leff, and I'm chair of the George A. Miller Committee, which through the Center for Advanced Study is responsible for the university's Miller-Com lecture series. These are lectures of general and scholarly interest, broad and interdisciplinary in their scope, and free and open to the public. The series, over more than three decades, has sponsored anthropologists, uh, animal scientists, poets and political activists, environmentalists and economists, physicists and philosophers, composers, journalists, neuroscientists, and more. Now, today's lecture kicks off what promises to be another wide-ranging fall series. Uh, the uh, th it's a series that's going to encompass psychology, medicine, genetics, post-colonialism, the scientific revolution, ethics, and political culture at times, in fact, in relation to each other. Uh, the next two uh, Miller-Com lectures will pretty much be on the heels of this one. Uh, they're a kind of combination of mind games. Uh, the, this coming Monday at 8 o'clock p.m. at uh, the Beckman Auditorium, uh, we will have Professor uh, Caspi on how outside environmental threats can disrupt our nervous system, uh, our mind. Uh, according to our individual genotypes. Then on Thursday, September 14th at 7.30 in the Lincoln Hall Theater, uh, noted author Douglas Hofstadter will speak on how various forms of analogy shape our creative thoughts. Um, if you want to be informed of the, uh, of the latest uh, schedule for Millercom lectures, you can contact us through our website. It's www.cas.uiuc.edu, uh, and it's the uh, Miller Committee. Now, I'd like to tell you that these Millercom lectures were to honor the scholarship of George A. Miller, who taught mathematics here for 25 years in the early 20th century, and who over his uh, career published some 800 papers and articles, many in his field of specialization in uh, the uh, uh, theory of finite groups, but no such luck. I mean, the reason this is named after George A. Miller is because he gave the university a pile of money. <laughs> he, uh, he somehow had accumulated almost a million dollars uh, as a professor that he bequeathed to the University of Illinois at his death in 1951, saying that, and I quote him, everything I have, I have, I received from the university, and I simply want to repay my obligation. Now, especially given what seems to be happening to uh, our faculty pension system, I am hoping that university administrators don't get too enamored with using faculty savings to provide for this university's future. But in any case, how Miller accumulated what contemporary newspapers called Miller's Million is a story for another time. Um, besides, he's not the only one um, that, um, that we have to thank. Uh, and uh, I, I very much want to note that um, among the sponsors of uh, today's lecture are the Center for Global Studies, the Center for International Business Education and Research, the Departments of Anthropology, Business Administration, History, Political Science, Sociology, Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese, and Urban and Regional Planning, the Illinois Program for Research in the Humanities, the Latina Latino Studies Program, and the Women and Gender and Global Perspectives uh, Program. I mean, this is clearly a uh, a lecturer and a topic uh, that has, uh, has generated wide interest across the university. Uh, the, uh, and representing a key sponsor of tonight's lecture, uh, the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, 
uh, is its associate director, uh, director, Angelina Kotler, and it's my pleasure now to turn the podium over to her. Thank you, Mark, and thank you also on behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies. I would like to thank all our sponsors who made possible Professor Lamnitz's visit. And it's a, it's a great honor to introduce you to Professor Lamnitz tonight. Professor Lamnitz is one of the most influential Latin American intellectuals right now, a pioneer in urban studies in the field of anthropology, and she's considered a leading authority in the study of social networks. But I also have to make a confession right away, and it's much better to come clear. I'm also very proud and very honored to present you, uh, Professor Lamnitz, because she was one of the, my major influences I received when I was a young student that determined my decision to become an anthropologist. So it's really a pleasure to have you here. Professor Lamnitz received her undergrad degree at the University of California at Berkeley, and since the beginning, she made a splash in her career. In her junior year, she wrote an article entitled Reciprocity of Favors Among the Chilean Middle Class, which was published in a famous volume edited by George Dalton, entitled Studies in Economic Anthropology, next to very few next to very famous anthropologists. This article set her in the course of her future research on social network analysis. The novelty of her work was to apply anthropological methods to the analysis of an urban social group and to show how a set of cultural norms developed through a system of exchange of favors. In 1974, Larissa Lomnitz earned her PhD in social cultural anthropology at the Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City under the guidances of anthropologists Angel Palerm and Richard Adams. Already as a mother of four children, she had to decide to engage in field work in urban, urban areas against the wishes of her mentor. In fact, at that time, in the 70s, very few anthropological studies were conducted in urban areas, one exception being Oscar Lewis of our own Department of Anthropology. Oscar Lewis was a, a faculty in our department for many, many years. And in fact, in those years, an anthropologist who did urban research was perceived as having crossed the lines of sociology. Professor Lomnitz's research focused on the study of rural immigrants in an urban shanty town in Mexico. She, she collaborated with a team of the National Health Institute conducting interviews for a survey on the effects of malnutrition on the mental development of children of poor families. A major influence of her research was the works of Karl Polanyi, who had an impact on various people of various disciplines with, idea, with his ideas of the different forms of exchange, as well as the work of Clyde Mitchell and the other members of the Manchester School, who proposed an analysis of social networks to study social organization in fluid urban situations in Africa. After a drastic reduction in volume from 22 chapters to five, this research became known as her first wild, widely acclaimed book that in English was translated as Networks and Marginality, Life in a Mexican Shanting Town, published in the United States in 1977, and its, uh, in its uh, Spanish edition is now in its 15, if I'm correct. The explicit use of marginality instead of the common migrants was the result of her discernment of a social phenomenon that was in emergence throughout Latin America during the 70s and what is now referred as informal sector. That is the increased presence of urban poor and informal settlements on the margins of the cities populated mostly by unskilled and poor migrant workers who lack permanent employment and unstable income. The salient feature of her research was the vital role of social networks established by members of 
households that came from the same village and had the same occupation. By observing the types of goods and favors they exchange, their intensity, and the definition of cultural concepts of, of trust, Professor Lomnitz explained how these networks provide a space in which an informal system of obligations was established and reproduced and how it was critical for the survival of the urban poor. Developing this line of research in 1978, she published with Marisol Perez Lisaur another seminal book on kinship ties among the socially privileged in Mexico. And this book was published by Princeton University Press and it was entitled A Mexican Elite Family, 1820-1980, Kinship, Class, and Culture. Tracing the story of an elite family that the work shows how it evolved as a distinctive so, uh, subculture given the ability to advance their economic interests of the members under changing political and economic conditions. One of the major fun fundings is the importance of the kinship connections, particularly those of the three-generation grand family as a basic process binding together people, not only of different generations, but also of different classes. The authors demonstrated that the top entrepreneurs in the family remained the acknowledged leaders of the kin, each one ruling his business as a patron owner system through a network of clients and relatives. Professor Lomnitz published other books, including The Chilean Middle Class, A Struggle for Survival in the Face of Neoliberalism in 1991, becoming a scientist in Mexico the same year, Chile's Political Culture and Parties, an Anthropological Explanation in 1998, Redes Sociales, Cultura y Poder, Ensayos de Antropología Latinoamericana in 2002, and I think that more than 90 articles in edited volumes and journals. As you are all probably aware, uh, yesterday the Electoral Tribunal in Mexico declared the, uh, Felipe Calderón to be the next president of Mexico. In this context, even though the tonight talks is not about the recent campaign, the last campaign, the topic is very relevant to understand the history of political culture in Mexico. Professor Lomnitz's latest book, Simbolismo y Ritual en la Política Mexicana, Symbolism and Ritual in Mexican Public Politics, published in 2004, explores the political culture of Mexico using, as an example, the last campaign of the PRI, the party, the institutional party, the revolutionary institutional party. Depicting as a system in which relations are based on, poli on vertical social networks and where political power is informal, the book strives to answer the question of what Mexican political campaigns achieve when despite the supposed competition, political parties display to attract the votes for the longest part of the 20th century, the winner of the Mexican president was already known before the election. Finally, I want to highlight that Professor Lomnitz's professional career is a long list of prizes, awards, and achievements. She has been a visiting professor at the universities of Notre Dame, Chicago, City University of New York, Columbia University, Wisconsin-Madison, Arizona, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, the University of Paris, and a prestigious appointment of the Wissenschaft Kolleg at Berlin. She has received a Guggenheim, Guggenheim Fellowship, the National University of Mexico Prize for Social Sciences in 1990, and in 1992, the honorary degree of Doctoris Honoris Causa from the University of Massachusetts Amherst for her distinguished contributions to Latin American social science. She has been a member of the advisory committee of the Kellogg Institute of the University of Notre Dame and a member of the scientific committee of the UNESCO Forum in Higher Education Research and Knowledge. In addition, she has been the co-president of the Society for Latin American Anthropology, member of the executive committee of the Society for Economic Anthropology and Applied Anthropology, and member of the editorial board of more than 15 prestigious journals. And to add, and I hope that this is not the last award, 
Professor Lomnitz just uh, learned a couple of days ago that the government, the Mexican government has uh, designated her as the 2006 recipient of the uh, Mexican award in the field of the social sciences. And this is one of the most prestigious awards that you can have. Uh, Professor Lomnitz will respond questions at the end of her talk, and you can use, please, the microphone. And also, I want to invite you to a reception after her talk in the second floor. And, well, with further ado, I ask you to join me to welcome Professor Lomnitz here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I feel very flattered by Angelina's words and by the fact that I just learned that I had been a certain inspiration in her career. I feel a little embarrassed about all this long list, but it only means that I am an old person. <laughs> and I had time to, to do all that. Um, I am going to talk about our latest book, which took about 10 or 15 years to write. It's an interdisciplinary study. Since I am not a political scientist, I felt that we needed in the team a, pol a young political scientist that would explain how the political system in Mexico operated while I was doing the informal aspect of that, of the campaign. And we started two years before using clippings and so on from newspaper, so the third uh, partner, who happens to be my brother, um, did the communications uh, study. And so we started collecting data when, they, when the party begins with rumors and so on and so forth, and, and the press is the main um, vehicle to, towards which, to, to, to the public, to see more or less how things are going and finally, three candidates appear in the horizon. Uh, and then eventually, people begin to bet and see who, who probably will win. And finally, there is something called the Vestape, meaning three people with hoods appear in, the, in, in uh, caricatures. Because at some point, somebody is going to pull up the hood. And this is called Vestape. And so we have a candidate. And then, of course, the candidate goes into a very complicated, long, and expensive um, campaign. But we all know, or everybody knew, that that candidate, in spite of the fact that there were others in other parties, was already virtually the president of Mexico. So. Um, Well, a, a political community, as it's, ah, I have a problem. I'll tell you what. The paper is very long. It's, I mean, it's 25 pages, but it, it's long and complicated since it's interdisciplinary, you know, and I don't dominate all the disciplines. But the, this is the first time I use, I use a PowerPoint. But the PowerPoint takes 15 minutes. If you want, we can just leave it in 15 minutes. Otherwise, I'll have to read parts of my paper. So do you want it in 15 minutes? <laughs> OK. So, but I'll try anyway not to bore you too much. So I'm going to be reading a little bit and talking a little bit and taking a look at the, at the thing. Every political community has rules that direct the behavior of its relevant actors towards stable patterns that guarantee the reproduction of the fundamental characteristics of power relations. For set rules to produce the conditions for their own stability, it is necessary for them to produce the adhesion of those who, in the case of a disagreement, would be capable of promoting a change in power relations. The rules to which we are referring those which the subjects effectively follow are, have two sources. The first one the, being the legal constitutional one, 
is based on laws written by pre-established procedures which are sanctioned and enforced if need to be by the power of the state. The other, which is of an informal character, is based on the exchanges and interactions which the actors engage in at the margins of parallel to or in the interstices of the legal system. This is the, the his, let's say, of the, of the study, to see, compare the formal and the informal. Um, consequently, upon evaluating the mechanisms for, for the perpetuation of a political order, we claim as anthropologists, the mere analysis of the formal structures is insufficient if not considered together with the informal dimension of behavior specific to the national political culture. This work shows the manner in which the combination of both kinds of rules explains a seemingly paradoxical phenomenon of Mexican politics from much of the 20th century. The political regime that operated from 1929 to the year 2000, the pre-era, characterized by the hegemony of the Institutional Revolutionary Party, included the punctual holding of presidential elections. These elections were, insofar as results are concerned, senseless. It was known with total certitude that the winner would be the candidate of the PRI. Nevertheless, on every occasion, this candidate conducted an election campaign throughout the entire nation, mobilizing thousands of peasants, workers, militants, activists, and politicians of every level while being observed by the entire country through the media. A perspective that saw only the formal parts of the system would have to explain this activity in democratic terms. As a candidate seeking to convince voters that his agenda is better than that of his adversaries, adversaries, punto. <laughs> However, the lack of a real electoral competition, the certainty of the pre's victory was, known, was a known fact that practically every member of the political community took as given. But this being the case, we would be unable to explain the national effervescence in which Mexico was consumed on account of the presidential campaign. Mm, I think it's the next one now. Okay. In this work, we will attempt to prove that once the informal rules unique to the Mexican political culture, those which regulate the patron-client relations, as will be seen later, if we take this into consideration, the election campaign makes complete sense. Although its informal motive was not to win the votes, it was crucial in renewing the continuity of the political system, in spite of the shakeup resulting from the change of powers. At the same time, it allowed the, the candidate in the midst of political divisions to rise as a president able to wield undisputed power for the next six years. In this proof, we will use ethnographic information obtained during the election campaign of Carlos Salinas Gortpatari, which was not the last of the uh, pre-campaigns, but it was the last of the big important campaign, campaigns. Although those elections ended up transforming the nature of the political regime, and resulted in the worst results a pre-candidate had ever achieved, it is possible to affirm that the campaign was realized under the assumption that the elections would not endanger, endanger the dominion of the pre, although this assumption proved to be false, and therefore follow the format which had been prevalent for decades. This work begins by describing the formal characteristics of the Mexican political system which was made in the likeness, believe it or not, of the American system, with its checks and balances. It then characterizes three powers and all that. It then characterizes the prevalent clientelistic political culture and how this led, in fact, to a result contrary to that which was prescribed by the formal norm. The concentration of power in the president, the great patron of the formal, of the political structure, and based on these findings from the fieldwork, we will then present the importance that, election, that the election and the campaign had in systemic terms. Okay. 
Okay. I'm not going to describe the formal political system, uh, but uh, my colleague, this young political scientist, he said that the formal structure respond to a Madisonian, or Madison, I suppose, model of democracy, whose objective was to disperse the political power as much as possible with the goal of protecting the, citizens, the citizenry from wrongful invas invasiveness on the part of their government. At the same time, the PRI is inter integrated in the style of a labor party by three powerful confederations of workers, which included the majority of the organized working class, all of the peasantry with communal land holdings, and a great number of unions from the middle classes, such as teachers, social security, doctors, bureaucrats, and syndicates. Despite these characteristics, the political system operated in reality in an authoritarian way, wielding the enormous power concentrated by the president of the republic, whose mandate was exercised without resistance, allowed by the division of power or the social opposition expected in critical moments during different stages of development. A great deal of the observable distance between the formal and real country is due to the informal behavior which occur beneath the formal structure and which transforms and adapts it to the characteristics of the Mexican culture. Okay, this is what I just said. Next. So now I'm going to just talk. I think this is uh, very important. Mexico was therefore a hybrid system conformed by democratic institutions and authoritarian practices. Okay, then we go into networks. And no, now I, I feel happier talking. Uh, I, I studied in the shantytown uh, horizontal networks, meaning networks between people that are equal, that have the same resources and the same lack of resources at different times, and the exchanges that they take place. I did it among the very poor, but in Chile I had done it among the middle class, and then in the upper class family, uh, I also did it uh, in the upper classes. But uh, in, in, the, in the political uh, arena, what I found, in, in other words, what I found is that people with, with, between people that, have di that hold different levels of power, what we, have, what we found was vertical networks. In other words, networks composed of patrons and clients, clientelistic networks or patronage networks. And that is what makes uh, Mexico a very authoritarian, vertically oriented, uh, corporative state. It was the 20th century state. But um, for, for the, for the uh, horizontal network, the key word is trust. If you trust someone, you give him something or her something, and then eventually the other person gives, you, gives that back to you. Uh, but on the other hand, patron-client relationships being vertical, the most important thing is to give to the upper level, to the patron, loyalty. And in exchange, the patron gives you job, security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the patron-client relationships are a form of reciprocity in which benefits to the subordinates are negotiated in exchange of loyalty and power. In these relationships, the resources that the patron distributes are employment, protection, public services, or bureaucratic favors, while he or she receives from the clients work and political support. For the people involved in, in patron-client relationships, this exchange is the fruit of a primitive method of redistribution with complements and eventually, which complements and eventually substitutes the formal and informal mechanisms of public policy and social aid. Okay, so, uh, okay, can we go to the next one? 
I kind of built a, a little model, which is the one that um, I talked yesterday about in my talk about uh, Chile and Mexico. But um, uh, those are the conditions which, uh, which decide or define the position of an individual in the, social, in the social system. The type of resources that person controls, which can be capital, political power, work, or loyalty. The level or quantity of resources held. Direction of exchange of resources, horizontal and vertical. And the, for, the formal or informal nature of the exchange. Can we go on? So the result is a system of pyramids, small pyramids, bigger pyramids, etc., which are concentrated at the top by a patron. Uh, at the bottom, you have workers or followers uh, giving that person support, loyalty, work, or whatever. The, the patron himself or herself becomes a broker an intermediary between the higher level, is between another higher level patron and, and, and so forth in the three sectors of society, let's say in the labor class, uh, the same in, in the private enterprise, the same in the labor um, sector, and uh, through unions, everything is being controlled high up, high up, high up. And then you have a series of intermediaries which actually move the whole country, okay? If you don't understand, I don't blame you, but I'll explain you later. <laughs> At the interior of each pyramid, the top to bottom redistribution and the bottom to top loyalty determine the social cohesion or solidarity of the group. Solidarity, in turn, determines the group's efficiency, which permits the leader to attain more power. At the same time, the sub-leaders within the same hierarchical hierarchy are all loyal to the same leader, leaders, but compete among themselves for the same resources. The clientelistic social structure thus described is one which concentrates power at the top and fragments it towards the bottom. Now, this is you would think that this is kind of foreign, but even I started my research on power in Mexico when I was doing a research on the National University of Mexico and studying scientists and scientific communities. And suddenly, I, I was supposed to study an institute which was uh, full of internal conflicts. And uh, the head of that institute invited me as an anthropologist to settle there as if it was an African village or something like that, or a Mexican village, and uh, give him a diagnosis. This was a biomedical institute, so they talked in terms of diagnostics and so on about uh, what was going on. And uh, of course, he knew, but uh, anyway, he wanted to me to, to write a report that would support his ideas of uh, dividing the institutes in two. But anyway, I felt very flattered when somebody calls an anthropologist and say, please help me solve a problem, you know. But anyway, what I found out, first of all, that the, the biggest uh, problems were because the, the original founding group of the institute was the group of Spanish refugees that uh, followed uh, Barnard, the, the French uh, physiology school, and then the Spanish physiology institute. And eventually, many years later, uh, biochemists, in fact, uh, Professor Soberon, who got his PhD in biochemistry in Wisconsin, near, near here, and he came back with his own students and so on, his own clients, although scientists don't like to feel that way. And eventually, there was this clash of schools of thought. Hmm? But, um, the problem was that whoever became the head of the institute had the power to freeze a department and to encourage other departments to grow. And that was what was happening. And so 
one group started protesting and going on strike, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and eventually, of course, they did divide into two different centers. But that's where I saw the struggle for power, because before that I was an economic anthropologist. And so uh, once I had that little model, uh, you know, power is very attractive. And so I decided to continue with that and uh, went on until I finally decided to study national power. Okay. Okay, can we change it? Loyalties and work are directed upwards, culminating in the president who holds, who holds you know, all these three, level, three sectors of, of the labor party of, uh, are like strings going up and up. And so finally the president is the one that holds virtually, of course, it's not, they are not really ropes, but holds all the different lines of power. And then he becomes uh, the, the great distributor. Because when a president, a new president comes into power, the first thing he does is to name his uh, collaborator. His, I say his, honestly, no, so far we haven't had a she female president. So if you excuse me, I'll just continue using the he. Because he, she, she, he, and then, you know, I get lost. Uh, so um, anyway, he comes into power. The first day, he already nominates his cabinet. His cabinet, cabinet, no? Yes. Cabinet. And people that understand politics um, immediately see whether he comes in as a strong new president or as a weak president. Because everybody knows who are the people that are loyal to him. So then you start seeing this and you see there are two or three technicians, technical people like medical, education, you know, some of the ministries are very um, characteristic, let's say, of technocratic uh, positions. And then you see how many of his own loyal people he put in his cabinet and how many people that were not loyal to him he has introduced. And then you can see whether he comes in as a strong president or not. But from the very beginning, he's putting two or three people that are parts of, he, of his little pyramid, and that probably from them, the next president will, will appear. But not always. It's not always from the beginning. And then what happens is that, that in every, every secretary of state, also has to appoint under secretaries of state three or four, and it's the same thing. You know, you can see a strong secretary of state has three out of four under secretaries of state, three that belong to his team. A, a, a middle one, maybe two and two, and a weak one, maybe one or, or maybe none. In other words, then the president also makes sure that he has at least one person of his own trust into these other teams, and that way about four levels, the four levels of the empleados de confianza, mm -hmm. are called like that, uh, confianza, uh, trusty uh, followers. And that way, in, and more or less, that system goes all the way down. Okay. The vertical social structure based on relationships of loyalty granted to the, political, uh, to the political regime gave a subjective and affective barrier which prevented discontent from being translated immediately into an advantage for the opposition. A group of followers within a pyramid which momentarily stopped receiving the implied benefits of the relationship with their patron would not look for a new one, either within or without the system, to obtain a more advantageous relationship such a, such a deal, because such a deal would be disloyal. On the contrary, the followers would negotiate with their patron who could persuade them to wait by reminding them of past benefits or of personal relationships between them or by granting them some compensation. In this way, through times of political and social crisis, the regime had an important reserve of time to recover and reestablish the status quo 
thanks to the compounded effects of the many relationships based on personal trust, which gave the system its foundation. As I said, all the power that flowed to the top through the brokers culminated in the president, who thanks to this controlled the strings of power, the party and its sectors. Okay. And that informally gave the president meta-constitutional powers. Because, of course, we have the other powers like Congress and uh, the Supreme Court, et cetera, et cetera. But through this system, the president became really the great elector and the great legislator and the great judge because he had influence in all these other nominations. Okay, the presidential succession. Well, the most sacred law in Mexican politics is no re-election. The president becomes completely, uh, not a dictator, but at least an absolute emperor. And, um, but, he has only one Achilles heel, which is that he can not, never, never be re-elected. And presidents that have tried to change, that there is a kind of a let rumors go or, or that make move, moves you know, to change the constitution, they are immediately uh, opposed. Um, the stability seen through during the age of this kind of presidential power, the adherence to the constitutional ban on presidential re-election played a determining role in a context created by, non by a non-competitive regime and a clientelistic political culture, this rule generated a series of informal behaviors that guaranteed the cohesion of the groups at power. The punctual switch, which took place every, uh, still takes place every six years, produced movements in every position at the high bureaucracy uh, due to the appointments which every leader made in favor of his, her respective action group, thus producing a constant and cyclic rotation of elites. And that is very important. Every six years, a new president comes, there is a reshuffling of the main important positions, and somehow this goes all the way down. Uh -huh. Now, the, uh, the president, uh, two rules were always observed. One is that the, the, the one was a formal rule, no re-election. The president choosing his successor was an informal rule. In fact, people always, and there are so many books written, who chooses, who decides, uh, because that suddenly the, the party, which is almost invisible during, during normal times, when it becomes active, uh, is about two years before the elections and before the selection of a candidate. And so they have all kinds of uh, meetings of the leaders and the, everybody's writing about it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And one day suddenly, uh, either the uh, confederation of uh, peasants or the confederation of uh, urban uh, workers, industrial workers come and they say, our candidate is so and so. It's not that the president says it. In fact, there is no proof that presidents choose it, but at least folklorically speaking, everybody knows that it is the president. And the president in the last years is sending red herrings, you know, kind of uh, be, being uh, photographed with one in particular embracing him or uh, going to, to a conference that another one has been preparing, giving all kinds of leads that it might be this or it might be that. But as I said, usually at the end, there are three, three sorts of pre-candidates, these three sorts of tapados. And one day that, that tapado is discovered, uncovered, and not necessarily by the president. So in this, this sentence, you have to take it as informal. 
In other words, we think the president chooses his, his successor. And in fact, there has been in the last years several books written, diaries and memories written by presidents in which they say, actually, that uh, of course they cannot do it by themselves. They have to take into account what is the situation. They have to take into account uh, uh, the mood of the public. They have to take into account what is the main problem in, in the country, if the problem is justice or the problem is economics and the problem is inflation, etc. So that when Salinas de Gortari was chosen, um, the, the country went through a crisis and uh, it was pre the, the de foreign debt crisis. So it was pretty obvious that um, the president de la Madrid probably was going to choose a neoliberal economy and not a nationalistic, revolutionary nationalistic um, politician because the, the discourses, the symbols, were geared towards um, either social justice or uh, pocket economy, household economy, et cetera, et cetera, inflation. So uh, the, the, the crisis that Carlos Salinas brought along was that the economist and everybody in the system, everybody that was playing that, of course not the not the housewives, not necessarily. Um, there was this antagonism between traditional economists, Marxists trained in the National University, um, more socially minded, let's say, and the neoliberal candidate, which was him, that was against the traditional ideology of the PRI, who was the party that came out of the revolution. And this was the real, I mean, there was a change of system with Salinas, that using the same PRI model, the same uh, structure, the same type of fightings, etc., brought in a right wing, so to speak, president. So the real change took place you know, two sexenios before, before Fox came into power. So this is the, these are the tricks of the Mex Mexican political system. Okay, so if anyway we know now that Carlos Salinas de Gortari was going to win, what is the function of the campaign? That was the original question that I had for, for this study. Bueno, the campaign was the method through which the political system prepared all of the actors for the changes generated by the arrival of a new group into power. It did so through the use of symbolic mechanisms of the Mexican political culture, which assured the continuation of the rules and fundamental pacts. The political crisis, which was inevitable every six years, was settled without violence or ruptures because the change was controlled through the ritual of the campaign. Yeah. I want to tell you again, I'm not talking about this year's campaign and election, because this year's election uh, was the, the second one where the PRI is not in power, where there are now three different parties, each one fighting seriously for power, in which the pre-era is over. In fact, the pre got the third place, as you may know. So, um, but uh, both the pre and the PRD are clientelistic uh, parties. And in fact, López Obrador was for many years a member of the pre. So there are still some remains of that kind of style. Claudio Lomnitz, who is my son and I am very proud of it and that's why I'm quoting him, has showed, after all I am a mother, that in Mexico, spaces for open discussion and autonomous organization, as well as those of representative mediation, representative mediation for collective actors to raise their demands to political powers have been substituted by political rituals 
which become arenas in which political decisions are negotiated and incorporated. The political ritual allows for pragmatic agreements and negotiations to be done by the parties without having to resort to legal norms or public compromises. Instead of formal venues to solve conflicts of interest and make decisions, political, political rituals present a format to express, interpret, and resolve political demands. The negotiation does not happen in a direct manner or through explicit exchanges between the party, but rather through dramatization in public spaces authorized for other things by giving an implicit meaning to the external roles with each actor which each actor plays there depending on his or her place in the vertical hierarchical scale. So, uh, we analyzed the, pol the, 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 um, uh, the campaign as a series of rituals, which you know, took for about a year. Uh, and uh, we started with the basic unit, which is the, the, re the uh, campaign of the diff in the different states of the nation. And they all kept one format. I followed like 12, 12 of these. Uh, we would go with the candidates uh, and, um, and uh, the candidates would arrive to a particular state. The same evening, there was a huge uh, meeting in the main plaza and um, people were standing there for hours waiting for the candidate to come. The candidates would start their speech, which more or less said the same thing in you know, every state, saying, I am so proud to be in this fantastic state of, let's say, Michoacan, with its beautiful women, fantastic vegetation, the presence of uh, an important lawyer that invented whatever, uh, the, the most uh, fantastic painter that we had in, in in other words, in every state, he had something nice to say about the state and its people. But he also said, and you are great because you are part of Mexico. In other words, the idea was to say you are great, but without Mexico, I don't know if you are so great. I mean, he didn't say so, of course, naturally. He was a politician, no? But um, meaning, here is a pact. You are part of Mexico. We are very proud to have you but you should also feel happy to be a part of this uh, fantastic country. And it's true. So, um, and then he went on in the next few days to have meetings with miners, if the state had the important mines, with workers, with peasants. He, in each one of these cases, with women, with Indians, in other words, all the cosmogony and cosmology of Mexico, you know, was done through these visits to different states. And, um, and, and the idea was, of course, meanwhile, he, ha he heard a lot of people and there was all, all kinds of negotiations going on in order to bring the president to this place, to that place, etc. But it was what called my attention was that, for instance, we would, I, I, I managed to get into the, a group of um, invitados especiales. And uh, let's say that we were in a bus, following the bus where the candidate was going. And let's say we would go into a plaza. All the way, the streets were full of photographs of the of the candidate, in other words, it's not the candidate saying to the people, please vote for me, I'm going to do this and that and the next. He did that, he did that. But the main thing was that the people were showing him loyalty. You know, he was seeing his own pictures. Once he left, they would take those pictures and put them into the other thing. Then in the walls, there were important sentences that he already had said, like, I understand the quest of the teachers as my mother was a teacher. Now, Carlos Salina de Bordac. So they, they would write in the walls his own sentences. In other words, they were impressing him, not that he was impressing them. Do you know, you know what I mean? Well, maybe it's the same here, I don't know. Um, the presidential succession must be understood 
as a especially dangerous time for the system. It is a time when, first of all, the outgoing president's power culminates in the appointment of his successor. Then it is a period of a relative power vacuum in that the act of appointing a successor marks the beginning of the fall of the outgoing president, while at the same time, the incoming one is yet to become absolute wielder of power, a politically risky situation. Besides, the succession generates a process of renegotiation of positions within the PRI and the government, a process which must be successful in order to guarantee the continuation of the system. Last, the succession within the PRI is risky because the internal split in the party can lead to the fragmentation of it, which happens in Salinas, precisely in Salinas election, because the fact that people, part of the party was not happy about having a neoliberal president, that's when Cárdenas, the engineer, the son of the president Cárdenas, split off and created the PRD and had his own campaign. So th th this, this dangerous situation of in between and betwixt of a liminal situation where you have, the president has lost power, but the new president doesn't have it yet, uh, is filled up with all these dances and singing and travelings and so on and so forth. Under these conditions, the campaign constituted a series of highly ritualized events which represented the drama of power in the Mexican political system. The campaign, the, campaign acts as, the campaign acts are places where the drama of the president and the presidential power are expressed. Also expressed are the conflicts and alliances which sustain the old and which will sustain with the, the new regime. The technical and mythical postulates of the political system, the internal organization of the party, of the government, the representation of these organizations and their myths are expressed. The new president's persona is built. The forces which move the country are expressed as well. The campaign was a rite of passage in which the group adjusted to the changes and adapted to new circumstances. Okay, now, this is in general. Now, in particular, the campaign of 1987, I already more or less told you, um, started with a big contradiction between a president, a, a candidate that everybody knew was going to move the country towards globalization and neoliberalism caused because of the foreign debt crisis that the previous president had to suffer. And, um, and so the, the conflicts were clear from the very beginning. Okay. During the campaign, the candidates, yeah, well, uh, I'll get to it. During the campaign, the candidates traveled throughout Mexico, and he received support, complaints, petitions, and praise from a great diversity of groups and individuals who commanded privileged positions for negotiation. In this process of identification with and of demands on the candidate, the personal identity of the candidate was actively manipulated to turn him into a persona who was a public figure and at the same time one very particularly identified with his followers. The candidate was made to pass as a member of every sector and state community in the, same, in the country. The very structure of Mexican political culture seems to have generated the efficiency of this method. In the campaign, every gesture presence and absence of the candidate before different people, groups, and regions were interpreted in terms of the relative closeness of the candidate to each of these, so that every sector sought to place itself symbolically in a position of being identified with the candidate so that the various leaders could project into their followers the other leader's privileged image. For instance, uh, but Carlos Salinas de Gortari was an economist, and he did his field work for his thesis at the university in Tlaxcala. So the state of Tlaxcala, when he went there, nominated him an honorary Tlaxcalteño. Then the, the um, Society for 
the uh, economist nominated him president of the uh, economic uh, whatever. And uh, his grandfather and grandmother were born in a town in Mon near Monterrey, so in Monterrey they invited him and called him el, el hijo favorito, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, whatever he did in life was somehow taken, his whole body, you know, maybe his ears, his eyes. <laughs> and also they had pictures of him. And at the end, you know, we all saw him so handsome, you know. I mean, it, it really became almost the physical type of the, except that he didn't have any hair, but um, like Jorge Negrete or something. So he, his biography in, in the nation was also taken, you know, as an identification of, uh, of him. And uh, at the end, where is the, uh, where do you have that, the candidate? There was one si sign there that when I was, uh, before I decided to do that study, uh, a friend of mine who had been in the previous campaign said to me, you know, Larisa, you as an anthropologist should study the campaign. And I said, why? She said, well, it's, you see the process by which an individual becomes a god. Because it was true, in the beginning, the guy is completely lost, he doesn't know what to do, you know, suddenly oh, he has all the press above him and so on. Then he sees that there are 20 people that if he moves a, a, a hand are more or less, you know, shaking, and then it's 200, and then it's 200,000, and then it's two million people, and then it's a country of 100 million people that in a way, you know, he has, he begins to learn how to be a powerful person through, through this. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an educational, uh, Ex, um, experience. The, fetish, the fetishization of the future president of the Republic was based on his identification with each of the parts of the nation. Mexican holism had the president as its key part, and the place of each social group was determined on the basis of its relative position in relationship to him. During the campaign, the fetishization of the candidate not only put the groups in their place in the whole of the nation, but it also established the future president as the axis for this distribution. By using resources to identify himself with the different parts of the country, the candidate, a veteran political interviewee, tells us, communicated to the parts that he would do nothing to alter their place in the system. For instance, I'm going to give you anecdotically situations. Um, it's rituals, you know, every place you occupy, every dress you, you wear, colors, flags, etc., have a meaning. So whenever he would go to workers' uh, sessions, the workers were dressed up like workers. You know, either they had a hat, a top hat, or leather, blue jean jackets, etc., boots, whatever. And he would also arrive in blue jeans and uh, with uh, informal shirts and so on. But whenever he talked to, to women, then they had this kind of symbol reversal. In other words, in, in meetings with underprivileged, less important people in society, he treated them as if they were the most important. So all the women's meetings, and they, they were new in this campaign, the women's meetings, were in fancy hotels. Women of all uh, classes in society were wearing different, their best attires, Indians, perfect upper class, middle class wearing. And he would come with a suit and a tie and was very flirtish with women and very simpatico. With Indians, it was the same thing. The Indians were supposed to be the ancestors mythical ancestors, and so on. So he would come, uh, you know, I, I went with him to, to Yucatan, and I mean with him, with him and another 100 persons, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I managed to go to Yucatan. And in Yucatan, the first act was in Uxmal, which is one of the most beautiful Mayan sites. And so he was standing in, the, in a pyramid, not up there because, you know, 
who can climb on that, but, but you know, standing here, and we were behind him, the special visitors. And first of all, there were pigeons flying and balloons and so on. And then a, a witch doctor with long hair and a terrible face was doing all his hocus pocus to call for the five winds so that this would be a favorable situation and doing it in Maya. So when he finished, then came a speaker who happened to be a, a sen not a senator, but a representative. And he came with an amate which is a paper done by the bark of trees. You probably know all these paintings in Mexico sold to tourists and to non-tourists as well. And they had written there a contract. And they said, we, the people of Ismal, who our last contract was with the, peop with the Maya people of the Chichen Itza in the year 1348. By the way, this was all prepared by anthropologists, I heard. Uh, to, um, we would like to offer you to sign a contract with us, the people of Xochimal, the Maya people of Mexico. And the points are, first of all, we would like Xochimal to be declared by UNESCO a monument for mankind, for humankind. Secondly, uh, we would like uh, you to start a bilingual education. Third, fourth, fifth, and the fifth was like, we need the price of guarantee of the corn. In other words, it was, you know, a different levels of abstraction and petitions. And so if you want, we can sign it now. And so we had to answer, no? And here was that huge pergamino sort of thing. So he said, <coughs> actually, of course, thanking me, Actually, uh, when I was invited to come to this sacred place, I said, I will go, but I don't want a political rally with noise. And indeed, there were no flags, there were no matracas or anything like that, you know, everything. I mean, for me as an anthropologist, you, you, you got to this place which normally is empty because it's a ruin, and suddenly it's alive, you know, there are, thousands of uh, Mayas down, down there in the ground and uh, everything is so authentic that you think that you are back into the 15th century. So um, he said, but I didn't want a political rally. I wanted to be a very respectful act of, you know, of respect to our ancestors, to you, who are the basis of our nationality, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, he signed the contract. And, um, and after that, there were children bringing him flowers and fruits and this and that. And it was a, a beautiful thing, all done by anthropologists. <laughs> so these are like some of, of the rituals that I'm talking about. OK, what else? Anything else? Okay. Um, okay. Okay, so I'm going to read the conclusions because I think it's about that. In this document, we show the ways in which the workings of a community's formal rules are molded and adapted to the political reality by the requirements and characteristics of the predominant culture of that community. In particular, we saw that for decades in Mexico, the vertical clientelistic culture based on ties of loyalty transformed the constitutional institutions for the division of power into presidentialism without limitations. And this was done without altering the formal dispositions in writing. Once the combination of formal rules and cultural practices are taken into consideration, it is possible to understand the meaning of a period event, of a periodic event, which because of the lack of a real electoral competition, seems empty of content. The running of an intense election 
campaign by a candidate who was universally known to be a certain winner. The ritualization of events allowed for the campaign to go beyond the instrumental value, getting votes, by becoming a way of allowing the transfer of powers from one person to another to take place without causing significant disruptions. Not like now. In the campaign as rite of passage, the presidential candidate used rituals specific to Mexican culture to revalidate the fundamental pacts between president, party, and society, as well as to build up his own presidential image and project himself as the great patron, the man at the summit of the nation's political pyramid. We now end by referring the, to the place in current Mexican politics that the cultural forms we have detected in this study has. The growing competi competitiveness of the party system, together with improvements in the institutions responsible for the organizations and validity of elections, have, first of all, give, ris give rise to the fact that for the first time ever, the PRI lost its majority in the House of Representatives and then the presidency in 1997 and 2000, respectively. As certain investigations had anticipated, these changes put an end to the predominant characteristics of the former regime. Today, the official country is closer to the real one in terms of the multi-party democracy and the divisions of powers, and the alternative also. However, there are indications that the clientelistic practices between leaders and followers still exist. All these lines are being, as these lines were being written, this was back in May or so, the three major parties are beginning their, no, no, that was last year, I guess, are beginning their campaigns for the presidential elections in 206, both for the mobilization of votes in their respective internal elections and the celebrations of public events. At least two of the parties are recurring to the use of clientele relationships, which the new and the old brokers put at the disposal of the candidates with whose political career they wish to prosper. Nothing seems to indicate that these practices will be cast aside in the constitutional election when the electoral competition generates its own pressures to engage in clientelism. This seems to indicate that the absence of a strong individualistic element in Mexican culture could put its own seal on the new democratic system and in the end might weaken its capacity to live up to the principles of one man, one vote. The prevalent vertical culture could, for example, culminate in a new form of authoritarianism with a strong plebiscitary component in which strong presidential leaders cultivate and foment popular support through the systematic use of the state clientelism. This type of clientelism requires a constant investment. Oh, I, I won't read it all. So anyway, uh, this is the situation now, and thank you very much. ask a question. Uh, you made a wonderful case explaining the stability of the 20th century Mexican political system. Um, now, you know, in hindsight, if we know the PRI had eventually to give up the power, um, how do you view um, the change? How did it come about that the PRI, PRI um, had to give up power? Um, the Carlos Salinas campaign in 88, I think, was the first where there was, you know, a very contestation about the outcome of the election. Um, many actually thought that uh, Gotari would have lost if they wouldn't have resorted to fraud. So how does such a stable system, you know, that is in control of the networks and control of the cultural codes, then, you know, comes to the collapse? Well, it was a gradual uh, situation. I mean, after all, they were 75 years in, in power. No? As I said, First of all, during the De La Madrid period came the crisis of the foreign debt and the country was in ruins and uh, 
probably among the deals with uh, the World Bank and all the institutions that, uh, um, to whom Mexico owed uh, money, they reached certain agreement to, to apply the Washington consensus policies. And, uh, and so De La Madrid was the one that nominated uh, Carlos Salinas de Gortari. As I said, my friends, who I have friends at the university that are economists and they said, the future of Mexico is being uh, decided between economists, structural economists and neoliberals. And of course, Salinas already had the plan of pushing the North American Trade Agreement. So he had a difficult uh, time because he had to use the traditional ways of getting into power. This wasn't a revolution or anything like that. He won an election using the same techniques that always are used by PRI. But in his discourses, he already showed um, you know, this ambiguity. Some, the, many of the meetings were talked about um, economy and about uh, uh, inflation and monetary things. And at the same time, it also talked about the, all, all the other things. So, but anyway, since there was part of the PRI that was against that, the old PRI, the old revolutionary PRI, so Car Cardenas came out and split from from the pre and, and created PRD. So the, the, the crisis began there. Then Sali, uh, Cedillo was a good president. Uh, he, he paid the foreign part of the foreign debt and this and that and the next. And then of course came Fox and that was the change of government. But curiously enough, the pre did, didn't uh, react violently against the Fox, the opposite. Lopez Obrador is reacting much more violently than what than the pre acted when they lost power. Because they lost power, but at the same time, they had a majority in the houses. And uh, they thought they, they probably would win again. So. Yeah, um, I wonder to what point do you think, since clientelism, obviously you are explaining the, the national system, but obviously was part of the party, explaining the dynamic of the PRI and the PRD potentialism was an split. So until what point do you think clientelism is exists today in the PRD and they have resources to use still these practices can be a force explaining, for example, the sustainment of the parallel government that um, or Lopez Obrador want to create or can, can sustain the protest, I guess is what I'm saying. What role clientelism can play in the protest that exists today, or not? I don't know. Excuse me, uh, do you know Spanish? Yes. Can you tell that? Can you ask me that in Spanish? Sure. No, aquí, más cerca. Ah. Es el, es que es el... Precisely. Well, as I said, I have not studied this campaign. I have just lived yeah. it, but not studied it. Speculation. So a speculation, exactly. Well, definitely, uh, Lopez Obrador's methods are the old pre method. He was a member of pre. A lot of his people are pre, were pre before. Uh, the most uh, nationalistic revolutionary pre. And, uh, and, and the methods are absolutely clientelistic, absolutely clientelistic. But uh, also, the PRI still uses clientelistic methods. So the fight now is between the modernization and, clientel and the traditional Mexico Profundo. But the traditional Mexico Profundo still, if you count PRI and um, Lopez Obrador, is probably a majority except that PRI uh, now is supporting uh, uh, Calderón. Anything else? Can I ask a, what's a naive and uninformed question, but I wonder whether 
I mean, you concluded uh, uh, that the possibility of both some kind of new clientelism, but also new authoritarianism. It, um, I'm wondering if in some ways we could read what, what you said and your emphasis on some of the stabilizing functions of ritual, that if we could read the decline of that ritual in the last five, 10 years, if we can read that as part, the decline of that ritual as part of the reason for the crisis today, that it might be, we could might perhaps better understand someone proposing a parallel government, for example, if we lacked, if the system now lacks that, that those informal rules, that um, some of that ritual that you've been talking about. So I just wondered if you wanted to draw those connections. Well, definitely this campaign had nothing to do with the previous one, except for Lopez Obrador. He still uses masses and talks to millions of people and so on and so forth. Um, but um, most of the campaigns were televised much more through the media than, than, than this kind of face-to-face -face, uh, relationship between the candidate and the, and the masses. So maybe you are right that uh, this lack of ritual, uh, people are used to this ritual. I mean, after all, campaigns were fun. People were invited, taken here and there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But n neither one of the parties had enough money to do that, except Lopez Obrador in Mexico City, only in Mexico City. Um, but I hadn't thought about the fact that rituals, of course, were important under the pre because, although they didn't ex they didn't need to, to to win an election but they needed to legitimize the election. And if you have a, a million people in the plaza and uh, all that, you are legitimizing the, the fact that your candidate is going to win anyway. Um, hi, um, I will take it that you haven't studied the pan, uh, but I would like to uh, the pan, you know, el pan. I, don't, I, I would take it that you haven't studied the pan, the panista, the, the pan party yeah. in power, as you know. Yeah. But can you tell us, I mean, what you think about the pan and, and its political culture? Um, I mean, they're, they've been in power, and uh, too many people in the PRD, especially those, you know, on the streets, you know, they think everything is the same. You know, we're back to the same kind of a, or the beginning of a similar kind of process like the pre started. But anyway, um, as an anthropologist, as my, perhaps as a Mexican citizen, uh, give us your insights on the Panacea political culture and uh, what, what do you think we should expect? Um, anyway, more on the Pan, please. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I don't know anything about Pan. I mean, I have spent uh, 15 years studying the pre and its elections and so on. And, but anyway, uh, now, of course, somebody has to do the same. But I have the feeling that uh, the PAN does not have a, a tradition of clientelism. It's a middle class um, party. But in the last six years, of course, they started learning how to, how to get clientela, especially in the beginning with Marta, with Fox's wife, when she started creating this Vamos Mexico and when she, she helps the poor and all that, these, these are the way client, clientelas are begin, are begun to, to organize. But you are absolutely right, I should uh, know more about that, but I'm so tired of that subject that that's it. <laughs> yeah, I had a question regarding symbolism. I was thinking about uh, the cases in Peru where uh, Fujimori was attacked through different tactics directly. I, involved in symbols like lava la bandera where they wash the, the flag or bota la basura en su lugar or something like that, mm -hmm. where they put trash in front of politicians or the case of Venezuela where Chavez has been attacked with his chickens. I mean, it was a direct, uh, was it hens? Was it hens? Oh, pigs? 
Okay, well, they can probably use a, a series of animals with him. Um, but the, my, my question is, uh, was the pre-use of sim uh, the symbolism that you were talking, was this use of, of signs in the political imagery they create, was it ever contested to your knowledge? Was there any attempt to contest? I don't know, was, was that part of how the pre lost its hegemony? <coughs> well, let's see. The campaign is a huge symbolic system, a system of symbols. Um, but the, the title is Mexico. In other words, nationalism, revolutionary nationalism. The whole point was to say, we live in a great country, Mexico, Mexico, ra, ra, ra. We are all brothers, we are united, which is exactly the opposite to it in this campaign. Um, this is our history. That's why like, we talk about cosmology and cosmogony. These are the groups that are part of our firmamento. No? And uh, of course, we are a, 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 a party in power and in the campaign. We are not fighting against ourselves. We think we are great. And, uh, but they did receive all kinds of complaints during the campaign. No? But uh, of course, they recognize that the revolution has to go on and there are things to be done, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, all parties in power, when they have campaign, they have to say that uh, what they have done is fantastic. And of course, there are certain difficulties, yes, but uh, we are OK. No? So um, I don't know if, for, for instance, uh, I, I, I didn't say that in, 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 I didn't have time to go into the, the, the book to go into details of, of, of all the details of, of what goes on in a campaign, which are really fantastic. But I'll just give you one example. It's not probably what you are asking for, but I mean, in Oaxaca, there are about um, 300 and some in, in municipios, no? towns. And so the, the candidate was coming to visit and had an act with the mayors of all these 360 towns. So he came and he was standing above. No? And downstairs, there were all these tables, huge tables for 360 people. And um, the table was set for breakfast. And so the fruit was, was placed before, you know. But the candidate came late, and the mayors were getting hungry. So some of them started picking on the fruit. And so the Erecanas, very nice girls, you know, beautiful, like we Mexican women should be, and um, came to, perdón, perdón, licenciado, please don't, don't eat the fruit because we are waiting for the candidate to come. What happens was the fruit was sandia roja. ¿Cómo se llama sandia? Watermelon. Buttermelon. Water. Huh? Water. Watermelon red. Jicama, which is a Mexican white fruit. And green melons. The Mexican flag. So the, the candidate had to see all this table with the Mexican flag, meaning Mexico, no? <laughs> and I mean, all these details like that. But I, I know that this is not what you asked for, but anyway, I, I just wanted to tell that. 